So thank you very much for everybody who's joined us today. Let's jump into it. So let's start with a few introductions. So joining me today is Megan O'Hara, the Employment Law Partner here at Law365. Welcome, Megan. Hi, how are you? Yeah, I'm good. I'm good. Ready to rock, of course. Excellent. And then for those of you who perhaps don't know me, my name is Elliot Burton. I'm the paralegal here at Law365. And behind the scenes, pulling all the strings and making all the magic happen, we have Howard Rickard, who's our digital marketing director. He's our general tech guru today. So we'll be turning to him if anything goes wrong. So Law365, we are a law firm that caters almost exclusively for the needs of Microsoft partners and the tech industry. Not only are we experts in commercial law, but we also have an award-winning employment team and provide executive coaching as well, helping Microsoft partners grow with less risk. So redundancy. Well, what do we think of when we hear that word? Now, I jumped online and looked at the top most associated words. Um, so usually the words that are associated are like fear, anxiety, some people payment, things like that. So it's not normally an easy conversation that's had in most business circles. Um, in fact, most people don't really want to be involved in a redundancy situation in any way, shape or form. In fact, even as you saw this webinar, you probably didn't think, oh, redundancy, sign me up straight away. But the fact is that redundancy may be required to progress and build a stronger business. It may even be vital to ensure that a business can, uh, continues and survives and thrives. But it can also be very destructive if it's not handled and executed properly. Now, um, lots of people um, have probably and actually been a part or experienced redundancy in um, many in a particular capacity. In fact, uh, we often see redundancy in the newspapers on a on a regular basis. So two weeks ago, we saw that 420 redundancies will be made at the Daily Mirror and Daily Express and Meta, including Facebook and WhatsApp. They announced that they'll be making 10,000 job cuts this year on top of the 11,000 they made last year. And on the 17th of March, there was the P&O fiasco of 2020, uh, 2022, when they um, when there were 786 crew members were told that they were sacked over a video call with immediate effect and no warning. There's that one there. So, of course, I'm sure uh, this is the kind of feeling we're going to be uh, as we approach this webinar. But don't worry, it'll be all good because we're in the hands of Megan O'Hara, who I'll be I have the privilege of interviewing today. So we're going to start this um, this webinar today with a quick recap on redundancy. Uh, we're going to talk about the, a little bit about the law and start to think about the risks that will be involved for employers. And then we'll, we'll ask the question of what is a fair process? How do we handle redundancy in a fair and um, reasonable manner? And then we'll, um, we'll begin to consider the alternatives to redundancy. And also we'll look at tips for good leadership in a redundancy situation. And then afterwards, if we have time, provided I haven't messed up everything with the uh, <laughs> polls, we'll, we'll have time for some of your questions as well. And yeah, we'll, uh, so if you'd like any, if you have any questions, stick them in the Q&A and we'll come back to you at the end. OK, All right. You ready to dive into it, Megan? Absolutely. Ready to rock and roll. OK, cool. So let's start with the uh, first question. What is redundancy, Megan? Ah, redundancy. So redundancy is generally uh -huh. less work of a particular type or kind. So that's generally what redundancy is. Great. Well, uh, I think that's the end of the webinar then. Great. All questions, <laughs> questions answered. Thank you. <laughs> Not quite. There's, um, there's actually uh, section 139. I'd like to do a bit of law for you here. Okay. Okay. The Employment Rights Act 1996. Very good. Um, uh, and we can talk a, a little bit more than just uh, the original bit. Okay. So, <laughs> there's, a, there's a few more scenarios. So you've got a disappearing um, business full stop. Okay. Uh, then you've got a disappearing workplace. Uh, and then redundancy can also be a disappearing service or a disappearing product. Or as we touched on just, just earlier, a reduction in a type of work needed um, uh, either for a role or across the board or in a particular location or site. So those are the, those are the, the kind of main scenarios but commonly it comes up redundancy comes up when there's less work of a particular type so for example let me give you a scenario you, you might be you might have the type of work of administration 
Uh -huh. um, so you've got one person in a business and a team, say so sales team, they're the administrator. Um, then over a period of time, the members, you know, the members of the sales team, they start picking up what was carried out by the administrator. So, um, you know, they start setting up their meetings, they start sending out pricing proposals, they do follow up emails. Um, and, and in effect, the dedicated administrator role is reduced. So we've got to the scenario where there's less administration work required. So less work of a particular, a particular type. Um, and I mentioned like a wholesale closure mm -hmm. earlier. So, you, you know, you can have like a whole business closing or it might be a particular location. So you've got, you know, the Southwest um, part of the business is, is going to close up um, or it could be, you could have a business that does on-site training um, and it does remote support, uh, but it decides the on-site training isn't working out, it isn't, isn't what the business wants to carry on with, so they stop offering that. So that's part of a particular business is, is ceasing. So all, the, all these scenarios is, is where people are affected by redundancy. Okay, so it seems like in the economy, this is something that would naturally happen every day. I mean, we've got AI coming in um, left, right and centre, so jobs will be replaced by AI. So it's kind of, I mean, it seems like something that would happen on a regular basis. So then what would the risks, why, why are we talking about, why, why are we having this webinar? So what, are the, what would employers be worrying about um, in the redundancy process? Actually, I've, I've, I've got a poll here. Let's uh, let's see if it works. <laughs> let's see what people think. What are the risks that are involved? Let's see what people are thinking. We've got things there like tribunal claims. We've got, let's see, what do people think are the top risks that are involved? We've got damaging company culture. Yep, employment tribunal um, claims is a big one there. Being unfair, Megan, what are your thoughts on this? Yeah, yeah, they, they're... Um, uh, really really good ones there i think um getting it right overall that that's what people mm. worry about getting it right because although um redundancy is one of the fair reasons it's one of the fair reasons you can rely on to dismiss somebody and terminate someone's employment um you can still claim unfair dismissal you know particularly crops up when someone's got over two years service um so unfair dismissal is a, a concern you know that it might be that the process hasn't been carried out properly uh, they might you've got to think about the risk of discrimination uh claims you need to factor those in we're going to touch on discrimination a little bit later uh, and up there i think in the poll there was reputational damage mm. you know it's what are clients thinking of this if they, they understand you're making redundancies? What do they think uh, about their business, leaving their business with you? And future recruitment can be impacted. So um, effectively, you know, employees that may look to come to you later when business takes an uptick again, you know, what will they think of the fact that you've carried out redundancies? So lots mm. of things to think about. No, absolutely. And if, if, you get, if you get it wrong and you do end up in an employment tribunal, I suppose that's your name, your company's name there forever like yeah. in the records yes. yeah absolutely so a yeah. huge risk yes. absolutely yeah um jump on to the next one here so broadly then um how, what's the best way that we can avoid um uh having an unfair process how, how can we prove that someone's been dismissed fairly because mm -hmm. of redundancy i mean your, your starting point is make sure redundancy is the right reason the re the real reason for the dismissal um, some some um, businesses get um, mixed up with performance mix that into redundancy so they say I want to get rid of this person I want to make this person redundant because they're, they're not not any good they're not doing very well and that's actually performance that's not redundancy particularly if you're thinking of bringing someone in to do that similar or same role so it, it's about getting the right reason um, uh, in the first place uh, you've also got to be acting reasonably on all the circumstances so um, this is this is often referred to as procedural fairness um, and it's, it's, it's a whole whole picture uh, so you start off with the, the process you've got give out adequate warnings of redundancy put people at risk you identify the pool um, it could be number of um, uh, people in the pool or it could be um, a, a unique role just just one person in that pool and then you move on to consulting with individuals and if necessary and appropriate consult with unions or, or reps um, in collective redundancy, for example, and there's 20 or more um, have been proposed as redundant employees proposed as redundant, then um, you need to get, get consulting with unions or appropriate reps. 
um, follow a fair selection process is another part of the process and considering suitable alternatives and offering the right to appeal. So there's a whole kind of picture to, to get, get right. Okay, yeah, absolutely. So, so can we just dive straight into a redundancy? Say there's, um, you know, there's less money, there's less money. Can you just, that's it, you can just decide like that, right, let's go down the redundancy rate or? I think it's really, really important to kind of sit back and uh, take careful stock of where you're at. So you start off, you know, why have you got here? You, you, you know, is it economic pressures? Have the products changed? Have the services changed? Do you need an internal reorganization? Um, do you need to, you know, jig, jig roles and duties around? There might be technical, logical developments. You touched on AI, that's, you know, suddenly in the, the, the forward chat GPT, you know, that there's a lot of that as well. Um, and, um, uh, there could be relocation of the business. Um, and talking of chat GBT, Elliot, can you enable the chat at all? Because um, uh, I think people are struggling to get into the um, into the chat. I'll leave you, leave you with that while I chat on. Okay. <laughs> um, so I, I think the so you sit back, think, why have we got here? Then you think, you know, is there any other alternative um, options? Um, you know, have you looked at recruitment freeze, for example? Uh, can you cut costs and expenses? Have you done that? Um, we're going to look at alternatives a little bit later on anyway, um, but but this is the, the pre-process. Mm. Um, and, and it's also before you kick off, what, what's on the horizon? Do you, have you put some tenders in? Have you put some bids in? And then some new contracts, new clients coming in? Could it, you know, you've taken a long time to train these people, build up your skill set in your business, get your, your, your business right. Um, do you want to actually cut those people when actually, you know, just maybe in a matter of months, there might be an uptick in business and there may be, you know, a tender that you win that means you then have to re-recoup all over again. So, you know, just think about all your, all your options. Think about mm. what's on the horizon. I suppose, yeah, absolutely. Like finding that stillness. We're in such like a fast paced industry. That everyone's gun ho, go, go, go. And really what you're saying is to slow down, take stock, get yeah. ready and then dive straight in. Yeah, great. So imagine then we've, um, okay, let's say that we've considered all this kind of stuff and we've decided, right, redundancy is the best way to go. Mm -hmm. Then what should employers consider when determining who to put into the pool, who to make redundant? What should they consider in that situation? Uh huh. So I think it's, you know, are you looking at a um, particular site? Are you looking at... Um, particular area of the business, um, a particular service, is that the focus of the proposal? Um, you know, what type of work is reducing what, what, or what will stop completely? Um, you start looking at, you know, not just what your employees actually do, uh, sorry, what, they, what they actually says on their contract, rather what their job, job title is, but what do they actually do day to day? So have a, have a good look at, um, uh, a look at that. Um, and think, you know, in this world of remote working, should you should you go broader than just a particular site or location? Do you, do you go wider than the Southwest, for example, that we talked about um, earlier? Um, and, and another thing that's really important is to um, uh, look at absent employees. So don't forget, just because they're on maternity leave, they're on long-term sick, um, that they don't need to be involved in the process. They do. It's just as important to keep them um, involved in the process. Uh, I think with pools, one thing it's really good to do is to try and get it right the first time um, because you know if you don't get it the right first time yes you can change it if you get pushed back you know you've got um you know Jim saying hold on a moment what about John shouldn't he be in the he's the same he does the same role as me and then you've got to backtrack and kind of start the process again because you haven't got the right people in the pool try, try and get it right from the start and it gives you know more confidence in the process as well. And say say we've we've got our pool together, and let's um, I've drawn up a little scenario here. Say we've got nine um, members of staff, but we now only need four, and uh -huh. we've gathered them together. How do we decide who is going to be uh, made redundant out of that pool? What's what's a fair way to do that? Actually, I've got another poll here for for you. So I've got some criteria. If we can have a little look at it and think, what would be our top three criteria that we would use in a redundancy situation? And then maybe, Megan, you can go through some of them and tell us if that was a good choice or not. Uh -huh. Let's see what we get back. Have I launched it? 
Yeah, I can see it. I can see it. attitude and skill set. I can see that. There we go. Oh, yes, I'm seeing skill set. Length of time with company, future potentials got a little bit, disciplinary records, experience. So no one's for attitude, personality, flexibilities in there as well. Um, Megan, what do you think here? What advice would you give for what criteria would you set? Yeah, well, I think that the overriding um, object, uh, objectives is to get the, to do objective criteria. So what you need to do is have objective criteria that you can measure against objective data. You've got that kind of um, classic um, scenario um, where uh, salespeople have targets to meet. So you, you kind of look who, who met their, you know, who regularly got their 30 calls um, a week or whatever it was. So that's that's objective data. So um, that's that's the important thing. If you get as much objective um, criteria, selection criteria as possible, that's great. And that could be um, uh, also looking, you look at the skills and knowledge for the role. So that's your starting point. And then you go, what is the performance of um, those, those people in the pool against those various job requirements? And, and you might use your appraisals for that if you've got, um, you know, up to date, full comprehensive appraisals for everyone, disciplinary records, experience, potential in the future you could use. Um, length of service is, is one as well. You just need to be a bit careful with length of service. You, you might want to just use it as a tie break rather than it's, you know, a big weighted um, criteria because you, you, there's a bit of risk of age and sex discrimination using that one. So just need to be a bit careful. Um, and then I think one as you're, you're doing this as well, you've got to think what period am I assessing this over? So for performance, am I looking over the last six months, 12 months, you know, make sure everyone's on a, a relatively um, level playing field as far as possible. Um, attendance, um, you can use attendance, but uh, you just need to discount um, any kind of family leave or um, disability related um, absence. So just, just bear in mind that, that you can use it, just need to be careful. But uh, the subjective criteria, um, if you can try and steer clear of that, is, if possible. So flexibility and attitude are more subjective. You know, you know, is me, there's you. I think someone's super flexible. You think mm, they're a bit, you know, not very flexible at all. So there's two quite, you know, people have different opinions. So one way, if you couldn't find objective criteria, would be to um, use two people to score so average out scores to give it a bit more balance and less kind of bias potentially oh, okay okay that's great uh, and just generally it's if you sit back and you choose your criteria and you think um a reasonable employer could have adopted this criteria um and measured them in the way they did then that you know you fairly scored it it's, it's consistent then you, you've probably you're probably okay. Um, so you, you don't always have to use the, the tried and tested. You may need to flex out outside of those tried and tested criteria. And as long as it's sensible and properly scored, it's it's fine. Okay, cool. Uh, and I'm I'm looking ahead to the next slide, and you've put consult, consult, consult. Now, might I be right that that's important, Megan? <laughs> yeah, yeah, absolutely. As the slide says. Consult, consult, <laughs> consult. So you need to consult about the proposal um, to, to make redundancies. Um, you know, is there another way for stop for this proposal? Is there another way for this particular individual who, who's at risk? Um, then you consult about the pools, you consult about the selection criteria, and you consult about the scoring. And, and they, with this, it's just giving employees a chance to understand, they question, they can question the employers, the employers in turn can clarify, they might then reconsider um, the approach um, that they're going to take. Um, I mean, ultimately, you, you're not necessarily going to bring employees along with you on the idea because it's it's potentially not what they want but if you're transparent fair you listen you're human um etc you empathize you know that that's the best you can do in a in a bad situation arguably um and what i haven't put up there is document 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 also need to um uh, document everything so record the meetings um in case there's a query during the process or after the process whether that's in a tribunal or not so um you know make sure you've got a record of what was said so the kind of overview process is consider your business case propose which roles are at risk of redundancy consult and then 
come to a decision. So that's the kind of over, overview of the pro process. Great. So consult, 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 document, document, document. I suppose they're the top things to take away today then, yes? Yeah, definitely some top things to take away. Excellent. Um, and then we've got also uh, alternatives to redundancy. Um, I wonder if you could talk a little bit more about that, Megan. Yeah, and I think with this, it is important um, to, to think about it all the way through the process. So at the start of the process, what alternatives could you, um, uh, you know, think of? What alternative ways could you go? And then during the process, you know, as, as you, you know, some, some of the alternatives that we're going to come on to later require discussion with employees and effectively their consent and their agreement to it. Um, so just throughout the whole thing don't kind of you know uh, the once you've made the decision to start the process think well that's the end of um any other possible options you know all the way through before think of alternatives um uh, you know and also think what were you prepared to consider as options um before you start the process that might be something to kind of have a think about before you start any redundancy process mm. actually we saw something in the um newspapers a couple of days ago didn't we about the um the bbc singers the um the professional chamber choir and the bbc were looking to get rid of them so they put them up for redundancy and then they've changed their mind a couple of weeks after and decided an alternative route so you can go back but there, i suppose there are risks involved with not getting it right straight away and not not deciding your alternative straight away yeah, that, that, that's right. It's, it's just, this is a bit like with the pause. It's just the confidence gets lost and you can, you know, it's for, for obviously the BBC, it's, you know, da damage their reputation in terms of, you know, why, why they not explored other options mm -hmm. previously. Um, there was a petition, wasn't there, that was signed um, by 140,000 people. So, you know, it, it's if you can get it right and look at the alternatives before you kick off a process, which is this process obviously now suspended, isn't it? Then that that's much the best way. And also it's the upset caused to um, all the people involved as well. Mm. So we're going to walk through, um, actually a lot of this information comes from a blog you did a couple of years ago, Megan, about alternatives to redundancy. So I've, I've popped all of the alternatives into another poll. And if we can go through everybody and think, what would you consider to be, um, what would you consider as an alternative for, an, uh, for a redundancy situation? What would we consider in that situation? If you could pop that in the poll, what would be the, perhaps let's say the top one that you'd go with? There we go, starting to come in now. So cutting bonuses and pay rises, Offering sabbaticals has, has got one. Offering flexible working. Yep. Oh, it's quite an even spread here. Great. No one's gone for layoff or short time working. Lots of freezing recruitments and retraining staff. Okay, so maybe we can walk through them one by one at a time, Megan, and uh, maybe we can go through them. So the first one we've got is freeze recruitment and retrain, retrain staff. That was a really popular one. So I suppose, yeah, um, stop hiring people and then look look for, see if you can redeploy people elsewhere in the company. Is that right? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So um, starting point, freeze recruitment across um, the company, if that's feasible. Um, and and it also, if feasible, you know, you might have, um, you know, reduction in work here, but an increase in work over here. Could you retrain? Could you redeploy some of your staff? Um, into other um, vacancies or other, other um, available vacancies uh, and that, that's what you need to kind of have a think think about um, as part of the alternative okay. options. And then the next one we've got temporary slash agency staff and consultancy contracts. I, I, I presume you mean different from what happened with the PNO where they got rid of everyone and started using agency staff. Is that right? You're talking about the opposite? Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. So, um, you know, it's it's the with a view to trying to maintain and retain your permanent staff. Um, can you, you know, end temp contracts, agency contracts, put give notice on your consultants contracts um, and uh, that could then, you know, enable there to be more work and also reduce cost. OK, cool. And then we've got early retirement. Does that that sound that might be good? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I mean, if you want to pay for it, I'll I don't mind. Uh, <laughs> no, I'm not going to pay for it, but um, <laughs> it, it might be something you're interested in. And that's one of the things I was talking about um, in terms of um, 
you know, discussions with employees is, is you know, you might think at the start, oh, I'm willing to offer X, Y, and Z uh, to, to employees if they're interested. And it's, you know, is that something you might be willing to agree to? Um, is early retirement, obviously, financially, that depends on the person's individual circumstances, et cetera. But that, that's something you could discuss instead of redundancy. Of course. And, and leading on from that one a little bit, we've got voluntary redu redundancy. So I guess that's people just saying, yeah, I'm happy to move on. Um, you know, yeah. for, for a redundancy payment, obviously, but yeah, yeah, absolutely. So you, you've, you've, we we we've been looking at compulsory redundancy. So effectively, um, it's there's no been no no choice in it. That's what the process we're looking at. But you could um, seek volunteers. So there might be people that are willing to volunteer for redundancy. It might be, you know, they're thinking um, this is the ideal opportunity. I wanted to set up my business, and um, this would just be the kind of final push to say I'll, I'll offer um, and and. Uh, ask if I can be um, made redundant, um, you know, before a compulsory process has gone through um, and, and that might work out. And then, you know, that's much better for the company if that's possible. Mm. And this next one I've, I've seen is quite interesting, sabbaticals. So I guess saying, you know what, guys, we need to reduce the um, number of staff in the office. Would anybody be willing to take a sabbatical six months, a year and then come back? And we'll, we'll see there maybe, who knows, go traveling, something like that. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So it's it's an you know it's looking at an unpaid sabbatical that might be of interest to someone. You know that might then kind of free up some um, cash and, and and help the cash flow of the business. Uh, you know it's generally a bit of a temporary thing. Also, although some people take sabbaticals and they don't actually um, return, they like the life they find um, outside of work. Um, so yeah, that's an option. Again, consent of an agreement of the employees needed for that one. So one to discuss if you're willing to discuss it. Cool. And then and then when uh, when we do jobs, who's doing the jobs, where we do the jobs, flexible working, job shares, that yeah. sort of stuff. Yeah. So you could have a reduction in hours um, across the role. So, you know, our administrator scenario, um, you know, instead of reducing roles fully. So two roles, I think, was your scenario. You know, maybe if everyone could go down to a three day week or a four day working week and maybe that could be temporary, maybe. Um, but yeah, that's that's another option to look at. And then moving on to option seven, we've got parental leave and extended maternity leave. Yeah, um, parental leave is, is, is something that, that some people are quite familiar. Some um, other, uh, other um, employees don't not very aware of it. It's uh, four weeks of unpaid parental leave um, that can be taken each year uh, in respect of um, children under the age of 18. Uh, so that could be something that someone might be interested in. You know, it's a fairly temporary um, uh, you know solution um but you know if you amalgamate a number of employees take that that could be good um for again cash flow purposes and extended maternity leave unpaid maternity leave that could be something that people are interested in again it just helps the the, the um businesses costs um reduce for, for a temporary period great and then, and then we've got bonuses and pay rises and i'm assuming that unfortunately, this doesn't mean they're getting more money. <laughs> they're taking this all away. Yes, it was it was a reduction. Um, I was uh, looking at in a reduction of um, uh, either you reduce or remove discretionary staff um, bonuses. So um, that could be either for the financial year. You might defer them instead. Um, you could also defer pay rises that might have been or otherwise in, in train. Um, and, you know, again, if it's about keeping more staff on, then, then potentially employees will be on board with that as, as a solution. And following on from that, we've got employee perks as well. Mm. Yeah. So employee perks, again, something you could, um, you know, it might be that you have funded gym memberships, expensive flowers in the office, massages, um, do you subsidise an office um, canteen or, you know, tea and biscuits in the office, you know, in the, in the meeting rooms? What, what could you pull back on and reduce, remove um, uh, and, and save cost and, and therefore potentially save making redundancies. Um, if they're contractual benefits, it's a little bit different. Um, but again, you could still talk to employees. Are you prepared to give up this um, these benefits uh, uh, until we're back on our feet again? And keeping the savings going, we've got freeze or cut training. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. so that, that, you know, although clearly for any business training and development is you know really crucial to keep um the, the momentum going keep um staff 
you know, on, ongoing in their um, development. I think, it, again, this could be a short term um, measure to keep costs down. Uh, just bear in mind if it's part of the employees agreement that, that you're providing training that, that that's a, a, bit, a bit more tricky. Um, but yeah, something to, to think about. And then we've got reducing pay as well. So we've got bonuses going um, either ceasing or, or being reduced. And then we've got reducing pay in general as well. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, one of the things is you could say, look, uh, across the workforce, um, are you prepared to take, um, you know, 5 percent, 10 percent pay cut, for example, or even a 20 percent? You know, um, we, we talked earlier, didn't we, about um, furlough and that was um, uh, and the pandemic and how that was something that happened um uh, quite a quite a lot that could um alleviate cash flow and it you know it could lead from the top managers and leaders you know take the lead and say we're agreeing a pay cut um and then um move uh move on to see if uh, other employees would agree that as well to, to again you know secure the business's short-term future at least okay and then we've also got layoff and short time working is that is that furlough is that what we're talking about it, it's it, yeah, furlough was slightly different because furlough was a special um, type of layoff that was um, funded by the government, uh, and, and, and so there was some money that came with it mostly. Um, but layoff and short term, well, layoff is it is unpaid, um, and it's, it's more of a short term measure. Obviously, people on furlough for, for, for months and months. Um, uh, it's a short term measure. Otherwise, employees can start looking to. Um, be made uh, to be asked to be made redundant and short time working is reduced hours and reduced pay. Okay, brilliant. Thanks for that, Megan. And I just want to bring us back to appeals because I know that we, um, you know, when we do uh, disciplinary or grievances, that sort of thing, appeals are super important. Mm -hmm. Is it the same with redundancy? I mean, it, it's uh, with this, uh, disciplinary grievances. It's a statutory right. Um, it falls into the ACAS code of practice to give an a, a appeal, a right to appeal. And f for me, I would always recommend um, uh, giving an appeal. I mean, you've got to look at the circumstances. Sometimes it's a bit difficult if you're making a lot of people redundant to give an appeal. Um, uh, but I generally recommend it, and it's just going to be considered in terms of overall fairness. Um, so yeah, pretty uh, pretty important. Um, it can flush out issues that might not have been spotted earlier because you've got a second person, second um, set of fresh eyes that are looking at what's gone on, so they can check the procedure from that perspective, and also obviously deal with any of those queries that the employee brings up. Excellent, great. Well, so now we can jump on to the tips for good leadership. So we've put these together, Megan, and I, I hope you can sort of walk us through them a little bit. Uh, so we start off with the top tip number one, and that is always be prepared. So I remember this from uh, Scouts, of course. I, I guess it is, that's what it says on the tin, it is what it is. We just should be prepared as we approach this situation yeah absolutely that was a you know touching on what i said earlier about preparing your groundwork and making sure you're clear on what you're doing why mm -hmm. you're doing it and why those particular employees are, are affected you know what alternatives you've already looked in looked into what the outline of the procedure is and and just be generally prepared for any questions you might be asked so yeah always be prepared great number two we've got tell the employees who face potential potential redundancy before anyone else so i suppose this is about don't let rumors spread don't go telling everyone and, and make oh. sure you control i suppose who who knows yeah absolutely it's obviously it's the right thing to do isn't it for the people that are affected they're, they're the ones to, to know first you want to get the, the conversation started as early as possible with them so yeah you know make sure you're in control and, and they're the first to know great Number three, we've got be clear, concise and consistent. I suppose there's nothing worse when uh, the boss comes in to tell you something and then you're like, actually, what was said there? I didn't really understand, didn't quite follow that. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's a difficult time for the employees affected to take in what's being said anyway. Um, so you don't want to overcomplicate it. You want to try and keep it as simple as possible. Um, I mean, in time, there'll be questions and, and you know, they're more in-depth questions. But yeah. Be be clear, um, you know, be clear about the timelines, be clear about the possible outcomes, you know, make sure what you're saying is you're easy to understand. Okay, great. And top tip number four, we've got proceed with caution. Yeah. Yeah, I think the, the, the whole point is that you're putting people at risk. 
and and it's it be be kind of ready to um, consider which way you might go with this and not have predetermined the outcome of the process. Um, it's the, the key is it's consultation, it's to consult about the proposal. Great. And then next one we've got is number five, be open. Yeah. Yeah, I think there's um, it's be open to suggestions is, is the main thing here open to listening, open to alternatives, open to consider, open to, to suggestions the employees may have. Great. And then number six, we have be empathetic. I suppose the, the bottom line is we're dealing with human beings. You know, this uh, everyone has their own situation at home, their own financial situation, personal situation. And it's being considerate of that, considerate of that, isn't it? Yeah. Uh you know, it's just, a, you know, it's a truly awful experience for, um, you know, everyone involved, but it, it's it's not about you as the employer, the business, you know, how terrible and difficult it is for you. Um, the people facing redundancy are going to undoubtedly feel much worse. So, you know, bear in mind, there's a human sitting in front of you. And although you've got your little prepared process that, you know, this is, you know, try and actually understand what that person in front of you is going through. Excellent. Great. Well, that brings us to the end of our tips for good leadership so yes thank you everybody for for joining us today and thank you very much megan for taking the time to walk through that that with us i thought the uh the stuff about the criteria was um was really interesting and all those alternatives as well and of course the the tips at the end was super useful so thank you very much so if any but we'll now move on to a question and answer session we've got we've got about five minutes or so left so if anyone has any questions feel free to pop them into the chat, uh, into the question and answer bit, and we'll do our best to get to them. Let me have a look. Chat shouldn't be disabled. <laughs> mm. We had questions coming earlier. If you can't, if there's nothing yeah. popping up in front of We've got some questions come through over email. So what I will do is I'll stop sharing. There we go. Hello, Megan. Hello. Hello, everybody. So shall I... Shall I jump to some of these questions that we've Yeah, got? yeah, absolutely. So the, one of the ones that came through email two weeks ago, how long do I need to consult for? So consult, consult, consult. How long, how long do people need to consult for? Yeah, well, it's it's kind of a case by case scenario, and it's you know can depend on how many employees you've got, because if you've got, for example, um, selection criteria to consult about, um, that's going to take a, a little longer, you know, you've got pools and selection criteria, it, it kind of would extend the process a little bit longer. Um, it, and it just depends what employees might have some suggestions and maybe some complex suggestions as well. So it's a, a case by case um, scenario, you've got set timings for collective consultation that you have to um, stick by 30 days and 45 days depending if it's 20 or more um etc getting getting larger but you know you, you've got to really be thinking two to four weeks minimum to um consult over but case by case basis and and, and it shouldn't be set in stone okay great we've got one come through in the chat megan i don't end the question and answer i don't know if you can see it so we've i can't got, see that yeah we've got an employee at risk is saying that it's not up to them to seek alternatives despite having confirmed to him the process and and used to uh the process confirm the process used to identify his role and all recruitment frozen and we are resizing the business where do i where do i go so an employee at risk it's not up to them to seek alternatives. I mean, in terms of just the alternatives um, uh, scenario, then that again, that's a bit of a two way process um, in the sense that it's for the employer to present any alternative mm -hmm. um, roles. Uh, you know that they may have vacancies that they might they might have that that's important for um, them to present them whether they they think they're more um, they're not appropriate for that particular person or not it's for the employee um, to decide um, and it's not up to them to seek alternatives despite the conversion process used to identify all of it was um, and and are we talking about the different alternatives? It's not for the 
I don't think it's you know the for the employee to suggest um, alternatives. They they can suggest alternatives, but I think the employer needs to be thinking through what options there are. Would they be prepared to do volunteer, um, uh, off, you know, take volunteer redundancy um, offers? Would they accept those um, and, and think of some other things? I think there's a, a big onus I would say on the um, employer here. Um, mm -hmm. Oh, good. <laughs> I'm glad, glad, glad. Thanks for that. Um, um, not, not at all. I just didn't want to make sure I was answering your questions. So that, that's that's good. Um, any more questions? Do you put them in? Have you got one more there, Elliot, before we? Yeah, I've got another up. one. That's here we are. Does the employee need to be accompanied during any consultation meeting? OK, well, I think this is um, a kind of good practice scenario is that, yes, um, uh, again, it's not a statutory right like like we discussed previously with disciplinary and grievances, but it, again, it's the right thing to do. It's good um, HR practice to um, uh, good HR practice to allow people to be accompanied. Again, talked about it being a truly awful experience. You know, you want to be as kind as you can to your employees, and um, that that that's a kind thing to do if they ask to be accompanied. Okay. Brilliant. Well, I think, okay, yeah, we're coming up to course two now. So I think that brings us to the end of our webinar. But thank you very much for all those questions. And thank you very much uh, for those of you who uh, stayed with us at the end. It's, um, it's, been, it's been great. Thank you again, Megan. Thanks. Thanks to you, Elliot. Great. And we'll, I'm sure we'll, we'll be in touch with everybody soon with a follow-up email. And we'll have um, the link to this recording in it as well. And uh, hope you have a very good day. And we'll speak to you soon. Okay. Thank Bye. You. Thanks, everyone.